And uh, for those of you who are new and have never been here before, there are two or three of you. Uh, my name is Jane, and I facilitate this space uh, every second week here at Villa Vista School. Uh, we here at We Are Church are a uh, non-affiliated group of Jesus followers, and we are simply gathering intermittently to worship Jesus, to attempt to follow him as best we can. Uh, we are not an institution by any shape or form, so you will find if you come here regularly, we do things a little bit differently. And uh, the time, hello, <laughs> little that <Nicola>. girl, <laughs> hello. <Hi. laughs> um, the time that we spend together is uh, quite family <coughs> focused and uh, yeah, very, very much about <coughs> what's going on in our community. And so that's what I want to do for the next few minutes, is just give you a little bit of family news, family feedback, some prayer requests, that type of thing. Okay. So there is a lot going on in our community. And uh, I guess as life happens, uh, there is the good and the bad. And there is the mix of struggle and distress and then the joy that goes along with that as well. And that's quite something to hold, right? It's quite something to navigate that um, as we go along. Um, and I, I encourage you to, to watch the WhatsApp group and to be prayerful as you try and think through what people are doing and going through. Uh, there's been quite a lot, and I can't give you too many details, uh, but there's been a lot that's been going on in the last couple of weeks with a variety of, uh, of community members. And so I want to say that if I have been slightly distracted and you have felt slightly neglected by my disengagement, I apologize. Um, but I do want to take the opportunity to then say to you that I am not the only one in this space who is available to help you. And I want to point out others right now who are available to support you if, if that's something that you need. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna embarrass anybody but because I know that the people who I'm going to point out will not be embarrassed. <laughs> but just to show you, we have what we call a little governing body. And essentially, we put them there for some form of accountability, right? Actually, we put them there because we needed to create a constitution because we needed a bank account. So that's actually why they're there. <laughs> but uh, they kind of keep me on track. And if I need to spend money, they sort of say, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. So Nigel is there, and he's been fabulous in the couple past couple of weeks, um, so he's got a whole bunch of stuff in his plate anyway, but he's also great because he is a social worker, um, so he can give me great advice on legal stuff and just, so, so he is there. Sean is another one, um, so Sean, if you could just wave, uh, Sean is there. Uh, the other one is Nicola, uh, so Nicola, if you could just wave, Nicola is fabulous. Nicola is a trauma counselor, that type of thing. Just fabulous, and I used her. In fact, I used her, used her a lot um, with stuff that is going on. Uh, <laughs> what's wrong? I feel very used. <laughs> <laughs> um, MJ is there as well. I think that might be my computer WhatsApp. Uh, you know uh, Lois, right? She does kids ministry. She's actually working overseas at the moment, so Lois is another one you can call on. And Charlotte. Charlotte is there. Where Charlotte? <laughs> so Charlotte is also there, which is fabulous. So, so there are people around, right? Um, and obviously you can contact me. And if I'm not able to help you, I will put you in touch with someone who can. Okay. So that is just by way of putting it out there. But it is very exciting. Um, again, I can't give you too many details at the moment, but things will unfold in the next few months. But there is a new baby on the scene. 
um, and you'll get information and you will see pictures as things happen, which is very cool. Um, and I just love it. So I'm going to see the baby this week. Wow. Yay. Um, and there are going to be some wedding bells, which is also very exciting. Um, actually, two. But oh, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> you are saying something. No, you're saying a lot. Jesus. It's not for me yeah. to say. <laughs> I mention it because bottom line is family is sadness and joy. And we celebrate it all. Yeah. And that's how we journey, right? Yeah. We journey through the struggles and, and, and we share it all, right? Um, and so we we journey together and we celebrate and we struggle simultaneously. And it's hard. It's hard, right? Yeah. Really hard. But it is what it is. Um, so, be that as it may, I want to just specifically say this morning, welcome to Olivia's sister, Mariette. Uh, so welcome. Welcome to Kevin and Colleen's daughter and her husband Duke, Taryn. She has a name. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. And Pastor Shana, you are welcome too in this place. A good mate of Zenobia and Denise, but also of other people. Lumengo, we haven't seen you forever. So, Andiswa, we are so delighted that you have your daughter back, right? Yes. So, Andiswa's daughter has been studying in the UK for five years, um, and she's moved back to Johannesburg. So, you are so welcome. Okay, so another bit of info. Um, you know that we meet. Okay, I'm going to do my, my graphic again, Julia, because it was quite effective, right? Okay, so you know that we meet on the second and the fourth Sunday of every month. Uh, but because of Easter, and because of the fact that in March, there are five Sundays, and Easter falls on the fifth Sunday, we are not meeting on the fourth Sunday. We are meeting today, which is the second Sunday, and we are meeting on the fifth Sunday, which is the Easter Sunday. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, March looks different. We're meeting on the second and the fifth. Is everybody happy with that? Now, one of the things we've done in, over the years is done sunrise services. Ah. And uh, sunrise services are lovely, but I've kind of made an executive decision that we're not going to do that, and we're actually going to do a service for a number of reasons. Because I actually would like to have live musicians and a proper celebration, and we can't really do that in the park because there's no power and stuff. I'd also quite like to give you warm hunkers buns, because I thought that would be cool too, and coffee. So, is everybody okay with that? Yes. Okay. So we might next year go back to the park, right? Or we'll just mix it up and have a proper service this year. Cool? Yeah. Happy? Okay. So, going back to this five Sunday thing, on the fourth Sunday, there is a social. Oh. Tanya? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we are doing socials by the social committee that I outsourced. <laughs> Me. Tanya, tell us about the 24th. Oh, so, hello everybody. I've missed you all so much. Gosh, I've been working away all this whole time since January, so everyone I haven't said hello to yet. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm super happy that the social is, uh, there is a social at my house. So I live in West Dean, um, the glamorous and exciting suburb of West Dean, <laughs> where you can, yes, <laughs> which, uh, yeah. <laughs> I had the idea that I would really like to do something um, a, a slightly different, um, and that is to do a, an art, an arts and crafts and music a soiree oh, social. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're going to have paint available and some canvases available and uh, the brushes and things like that. You're very welcome to bring your own stuff. For those who do not feel artistically inclined, 
I, I, we might even have two weekly emails. Somebody would rather have some of the autistic guns to them instead of paying for me to be. <laughs> but he's also going to have time for some art. But anyway, so nothing um, uh, fancy or, or hectic. Uh, I will be doing like a quick poor class, which is the, the lowest possible level of artistic involvement for anybody who feels like they'd like to try doing something and feels like, oh, I'm not creative. I guarantee you are. We also have I've got a beautiful piano, a piano piano, not a keyboard, that is in tune, mm. pretty much in tune. So I would love it if someone would bring a guitar as well. Um, and will there be some food? jam? Pardon? Will there be food? And they add, oh, it's very important that they will be food. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a pile of food as usual. Anyone who's been to my house knows how that goes. <laughs> There's always a pile of food. So it'll be from 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock roughly. I will need to know beforehand, so I'll, I'll put it out on the group again. Just read, please RSVP so that I know how many um, I know how many vehicles we'll have because I will need to organize a, a, a car guard because, like I said, it's the illustrious and glamorous and you all have to keep our cars. So, but please don't be put off like that. It's a lovely, lovely area. We've got a lovely, big, lengthy, shady garden and a couple of very friendly hooligan dogs. And I'd love, love, love you guys to be there. It's going to be great. <laughs> Okay, um, before we go there, I just want to ask you to specifically remember um, Balaki's mom. She, uh, she often comes in the sound here on a walker, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she's, Balaki was telling me she's 89, mm. right? And uh, she's really struggling with um, old age stuff, right? Mm. So if we could just be remembering her. But we have... Um, a few things that we are uh, needing to think through and just remember. And the first thing, uh, Leanne has a couple of things she wants to report back on. Yeah, good morning. I just wanted to quickly share that in, um, two kind of things I've shared twice this year. Um, and, and so the first from a be true to me perspective, um, that yesterday I got a phone call from one of the political parties who wants to engage. Um, mm -hmm after I publicly called them out for their transphobic and homophobic language. So that's happening next week. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, if you can just hold that up in my prayers. Um, and then secondly, the, the Justice Project for Art um, and how much this community has heeded the call. And I just wanted to say a big thank you. Um, and, and just to see smiles on faces of people who, do you remember what the three Ds were that I spoke about? Yes. <laughs> That's <Nigel>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the one was despondent. And uh, to see some of those despondent faces with smiles this week, um, just to say that God does smile through despondency. around Gaza, uh, you will know that um, Ramadan starts now, and um, we toed and fro on WhatsApp about it being very noted. Good morning, folks. Let me rather do that. Uh, yeah, I think you know so much, so much need and so much pain in the world right now. But we especially just wanted to. Take a minute to lift up the, the people in Gaza, especially as Jane said, as Ramadan begins. So if we could all just bow our heads in prayer. God, we come to you this morning. Um, a lot of us with broken hearts around what's happening in, in Gaza and um, just full of sorrow for the people of, of Palestine uh, generally. We think of the the suffering they've gone through, the loss that they've experienced, the loss that they're anticipating. <clears throat> Father, millions of your children who just have nowhere to go and who've lost family and who've lost friends and who now face uh, 
tremendous uncertainty as to what's going to happen next. So, uh, God, we pray your blessing on them. We pray your protection on them. We pray even in this moment of tumult and chaos that you would bring your peace to them, Lord, that you would let them feel your presence. Um, God, we, we just lift them up to you. Lord, we, we, we know that you somehow ask us even to pray for those who persecute. And so we pray too for the, the Israeli government. Pray that you would uh, somehow soften their hearts, Lord, that you would convict them, that you would show them a different way. God, we don't, we don't even know how to pray in, in this situation sometimes, but we know that you know our hearts. And so we pray that you would just yeah, work, work on every side, Lord, and from every angle and in every heart. God, we pray for world leaders. We pray that you would give them the courage to stand up and to take a stand and to push for a better way and to push for peace and to push for justice. And, and we pray for ourselves, God. We pray that we would not look away as hard as it may be. We pray that you would uh, open our hearts, convict us on what we can do, Protect us too, Lord, from despair. I know a lot of us are feeling that. So uh, we know that you are a God of hope. We know that you have a way forward. We know that you are with us and that you are with the people of Palestine. And so we just pray uh, that you would remind us of that and that you would remind them of that, that you would hold all of us in your hand. Lord, we lift everyone up and we know that you are uh, with us and that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now the official social justice love. <laughs> Inje, the best speaker. Good morning, church. Good morning, Inje. So, um, about 18 years ago, uh, I first set foot at Grace Point. Um, I was part of a band called We Will Worship. And we were young, we were about diverse worship. We didn't really know what we, we just knew that Jesus loved everyone and he's for everyone and we wanted to write new songs and all of that. I wasn't the most sold out member to the whole diverse worship stuff myself. I was at the back of the bus. I remember getting to Grace Point and thinking to myself, so many white people. Yeah. <laughs> Why aren't they clapping? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I will never, ever say space. But 10 years ago, after coming out, after millions of fans coming through and joining We Will Worship and following We Will Worship and having to leave my space because I'm gay but I love Jesus, the first miracle I got to Grace Point. And my good friend Greg, who's the music director at Grace Point, and we're still friends even now. We were driving here, back when it was still called Melrose Church, and he said to me, buddy, you know, there are so many girls who like you at Grace Point. So-and-so likes you, so-and-so. So I was like, buddy, I don't think I'll ever, ever introduce you to a girlfriend. I'm gay. I was like, well, if he kicks me out, <laughs> he kicks me out. Yeah. And he said, you know, buddy, the best person to talk to about this is Graham. And so, one day I approached Jane and I was like, hi, I'm NJ and I'd like us to be friends. And we've been friends since. Um, what am I trying to say? They cook two things. One, diverse worship or music has been the entry point for me to see that it pleased a diverse God to create a diverse people. Mm. And to also see that South Africa's unique selling position is indeed our diversity. But to sit with Rachel Held Evans and Steve Biko at the same time, those are two difficult things to hold. But I'm not moved by just my blackness or the story of South Africa. I am moved by my conviction that Christ died for me and he died for all. And to create a space for everyone to have a seat in the sun. And secondly, I know Jane, I'm going to pull at the end. And secondly, to, um, to create a safe space for the LGBTQI community oh, yes. coming from where I come from. Amen. Because 
every now and again I'm flooded with inboxes of horror stories of rejection, violent rejection from the church. And if you know anything about my people, and I mean the black people, the church has been a central pillar for all the things we actually go through. So, where am I going with this? I have an opportunity through the partnership of Downtown Music Hub and the Department of Arts and Culture to record a worship project called Songs from the Margins, where we will be embracing different expressions of worship. It also, me pointing out, celebrating the 10 years of living in these two different communities. Just to give you a picture, in the morning, Shane, Jen, I sent you a message yesterday. I was like, I don't even know how I'm going to get to church. And even if you send an e wallet, all the ATMs have been bombed. And so the mall is closed. So I had to walk from my home to the mall. Take out the e wallet, take a local taxi, take another taxi, get into an Uber just to get here. Why? Because special planning of the apartheid government. Why? Because even after all these years, we still have proximity to one another and not real relationships. And why? Also, the biggest one is because diverse worship only happens in leafy suburbs of Johannesburg. So with this project, we are going to be creating opportunities to take worship and to take the diverse spaces in the different parts of um, South Africa. And as you know, the church, is, the church is not for the gays. So we'll be meeting in people's homes like the first believers. So in one, we'll do it sporadically. Which like English word? Which one? Is it sporadically or entertain, entertainment? Which one? We'll do it every second month. Where we would gather, let's say, in a township, and then maybe move to Charlotte and Garrett Space, because I've been there a few times, and I am asking them right on the spot. But where can you come in? So there's, there's four things. One, I'm recording on the 30th, and I'd like to have my faith community there. So it's a limited space. So if you're interested, it's Downtown Music Hub is in Johannesburg, CBD. So just send me a WhatsApp. I'll just say, hi, this is AJ. And then I'm really shy when it comes to WhatsApp groups. So if we can just send me a, a, a because my English, if you think my English is small when I'm speaking, yo, my written English is even small, small. So there's that. And then two, um, the opportunity comes with just the recording space. So I need to get my team of very young people who love Jesus and who come from diverse spaces. And I also need to get Trish there because we have a song that we've written. Um, so there's that. Um, there are a number of costs there. So um, again, if you're interested to know how you can partner with us financially, you can send me, I mean, um, I'll send my WhatsApp number and then we can just talk offline. Um, please, I need lots and lots and lots of prayers. Um, because it's quite a huge undertaking. There's a lot, there's producers fees, there's writers fees, there's, there's also uh, uh, advertising and all of that. And um, lastly, yeah, uh, we need financial support, we need prayers, and yeah, you can just sign up. I think there's space for about 15 people if you're interested. We're recording on the 30th at Downtown Music Hub. You can just send me your names. Thank you. Oh, and we'll be recording Shawarma uh, as well. Our Christmas Yeah, good. <laughs> Dear God, this is um, a prayer of thanks. We thank you for NJ. We thank you for who he is to everyone in this community. We thank you for his gayness. We thank you for his blackness. We thank you for his commitment to creating pockets of church wherever he is. We thank you for his gifts. We thank you for your calling on his life. We thank you for the light that you've put in him that cannot be dimmed by any external circumstances. God, we thank you for this amazing opportunity to, to create spaces of diverse worship of worship that honors a God of the margins. God, we ask for, for wisdom as NJ embarks on this project. We ask for provision, for hearts to be touched of people who can contribute to this project. We ask God that you will bring people across his path who need 
to be involved in this project. We, we are so excited as we anticipate the end result and we are filled with gratitude. We just say thank you. Okay, Julia, it's time to take the children. And uh, this morning, Kevin is going to bring God's word to us. So, Kevin, if you want to come up with your stick. <laughs> right, we, we're back to numbers. I don't know if uh, those of you here at my last share, um, I spoke from the book of numbers. Well, I'm back in numbers again. Um, so let me hear you say the word Torah. Torah. Okay, Torah we know is the first five books of the Bible, right? Also known as the law. So we know it as the law. The Jewish people call it the Torah. And um, in, in Jesus' day, Torah was central to life. It was everything. You would obey Torah. You would study the Torah. Probably by the age of 10, you would have Torah memorized. We spoke about that last time. Ben Sefer which is that first um, educational thing that you go to. Um, as a young Jewish person, you learn to memorize the Torah. So Torah was truth. Torah was the way and Torah was life in Jesus' day. And when Jesus came, he didn't actually come to get rid of Torah. He came to make it speak. He came to show what Torah looks like in flesh and blood. So this passage was incredibly familiar to the people of the day, of Jesus' day, when he uh, came to earth as our Messiah. Let's just pray quickly. Yahweh, Master of the Universe, speak to us this morning. We have millions of distractions around us, and many of us are desperate to hear from you today. We thank you that as the Messiah, you are repairing and restoring a broken world. And we want to be part of the action. We want to be part of what you are doing. And whatever you need to speak to each one of us, we give your spirit the freedom to move in this room and to speak to each one of us deep down in our souls. Amen. All right, so let's start by reading from Numbers 6. And for those of you who do have Bibles here, I would actually like you to open up to number six from the beginning. Because I want to just unpack one of the words that comes up in this passage. So I want to kind of hear from different translations. So if you can open up to number six from verse one. Yahweh said to Moshe, Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of separation to the Lord is a Nazarite. If a man or woman wants to make a special vow, what does your translation say? Special? Hmm? Special, okay, but what kind of vow? Special vow? Are there any other words that are used? Just special? Just special. Eh? Everybody's translation said special. All right, that's fine. We can, the word special here is actually an awkward interpretation of a very, or part of a very, comprehensive uh, Hebrew phrase. And the word that is used here is the word that we would pronounce kli, p, uh, p apostrophe ly. So ply, but we pronounce it kli. Okay? And let's just look at two other places that it occurs in Scripture. If we look at Judges uh, 13 verse 19, it says this, then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did a plea thing, an amazing thing, while Manoah and his wife watched. So here the word is used as amazing. Okay, so we've had special, and now we have the word amazing that's used. Same word, same Hebrew word, plea. All right? Then in Psalm 77, verse 11, it says this, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your pleas of long ago. And here we have the word miracles. So miracles, plea, okay, amazing, plea, special, 
be. So see the many ways that this word is used in the Hebrew text. All right, so it's something amazing and wondrous, all right, and special. So when they say that um, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, this is an amazing vow, a vow of separation to the Lord. All right. So the premise of Numbers is that if anyone wants to see God do something special or wondrous <coughs> or miraculous or amazing in their life, then they would do these three things that we're going to read about now, which is the Nazarite vow. All right? So you want to do something amazing, wondrous, special, do these three things. All right? Firstly, you must abstain from wine and other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar, which isn't a problem for many of us, right? <laughs> um, made from wine or from fermented drink. He must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as he's a Nazarite, he must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. So that's number one, right? Now, in the days when Jesus came to earth, wine was actually a big thing. Right? It was part of just about every single celebration. You go to a wedding, you drink wine. Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding. All right? you, you go to the temple to celebrate any other feast, the feast of the tabernacle, Pesach, you would celebrate with wine. All right? uh, Shabbat, on a Friday when you were together as a family and you welcomed the Sabbath in, you would welcome it in with a cup of wine. Jesus, at his last supper, what did he do? He toasted with his disciples with a cup of wine. So very, very much part of their culture in the day. All right. Um, in fact, when, when God spoke to the Israelites and he said, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. He said, I'll do four things. I'll bring you out of Egypt. I'll redeem you. I'll rescue you. Um, and I'm going to bring you to me, closer to me. Those are four things. And those four promises of God were celebrated with four cups of wine. Okay? Into... Uh, in the history of, of Israel and how they, when they remembered what God had done for them in the in Exodus, okay, redeeming them from the Egyptians. All right, so um, number two, during the entire period of his vow of separation, no razor may be used on his head. He must be holy until the period of his separation to the Lord is over. He must let the hair of his head grow long. Okay, so there's some person here with long hair, okay, thinking I'm just being obedient, all right, okay, but you would let your hair grow, you wouldn't take a razor to your head, that's number two. Number three, throughout the period of separation to the Lord, to the Lord, he must not go near a dead body, even his own father or mother or brother or sister dies, he must, make, he must not make himself unceremoniously clean. It's a funny thing that, right? Not to go near a dead body, all right? Easy for us, but not so easy in the day when you lived in insulas or compounds. When you witnessed birth in the room that you slept in. Mm. Where you witnessed death in the room that you slept in. Because there was no net care. Mm. There was no hospice, all right, for you to take somebody to that were on their last legs. Okay? They would die at home, in your presence, effectively. All right. So, they would be there, um, close to you, and you would, uh, you would be witnessing this on a fairly regular basis, your grandparents or parents or whatever. All right. Now, the question is, how long do these people make this vow for? Okay, and Numbers doesn't really stipulate how long the vow is for, and it seems as if you can kind of make this vow for however long you choose to make the vow. All right, so people made it for different periods. Um, I'm going to look at two historical sources. Um, here's one that says, Now she, Bernice, dwelt then at Jerusalem. In order to perform a vow which she had made to God, and for 30 days before they ought to offer their sacrifices, to sustain from wine, and then to shave the hair of their head. So this Bernice took the vow for seven days, right? There's another one from Mishnah, the writings of Mishnah. Queen Helena 
had almost completed a seven-year vow when she was defiled, requiring her to start over again. <laughs> you bum. <laughs> right. Okay, you have taken this vow and done everything right for seven years, and something happens that you have to restart this whole vow. Okay. Now, the next part of the text here in Numbers talks about what you have to do once you've completed the vow. All right? Then on the eighth day, he must bring two doves or young pigeons to the priest. The priest should offer one as a sin offering. Okay, that's if, if you've been defiled. Um, okay. Now, this is the law for the Nazarite. When the period of his separation is over, so his vow is over, he is to be brought to the entrance to the tent of the meeting. Okay, or to the tabernacle, to the temple. Okay. There he is to present his offerings to the Lord, a year old lamb, a year old male lamb without defect, okay, for a burnt offering, a year old youth lamb without defect for a sin offering, a ram without defect for a fellowship offering, that's three, three rams, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings and a basket of bread made without yeast, cakes made of fine flour mixed with oil and water spread with oil and a salad. <laughs> so those are the things you have to bring. Number one, a year old male lamb. Number two, a year old ewe lamb, female lamb. Number three, a ram for the fellowship offering. Number four, grain offerings. Number five, drink offerings. Number six, a basket of bread without yeast, water, etc. Now this is an unbelievably expensive list. People don't have these kind of things. The normal person doesn't have these kind of things lying around. You know, you and I might think of it of, you know thousand bibless chairs and you know a flat in four way or um, you know one of our cars that we have is so these are these are expensive things um, so that would be a modern example and often people that had finished their vow and they came to the temple they would require help from their community just as we were talking about how we come together here as a community in many instances if you had finished your vow you might need some help from the community in paying for these sacrifices that have to take place. Okay. Um, now let me let me go to Acts quickly, and uh, I want to just tell you what happens. Um, Acts twenty one verse twenty three, and the context here is that Paul had been traveling outside of the Jewish world now. So he'd, he'd gone out of Israel and he was traveling mostly to the Greek community. And all these people are saying yes to Jesus as the Messiah as Paul is traveling. They are acknowledging that Jesus came, that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God. But accusations are flying about Paul that he's not being obedient to the Torah. Okay? And he's ignoring the Torah. So these were <laughs> just some of the controversies that Paul was faced with in the day. So how was he going to show the people that there was something new happening here? And that he was living in obedience to the Torah. Okay, and, and what he does, okay, is he grabs a couple of people um, that have been doing the Nazarite vow. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men and join in their purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. And everybody will know. There is no truth in these rumors or reports about you that, you, that you yourself are living in the obedience to the law or in obedience to Torah. Okay? So what Paul is doing is just kind of linking back to what the Torah says, to trying to say, listen, kind of combining the old and new here, right? You're doing something different, you're doing something new. So what he did is he got these men in who were maybe playing cards at the temple or something because they couldn't afford pays for these sacrifices and they said why don't you pay for the expenses so that they complete their vow can, can complete their vow all right some of you are thinking where are we going with this um, but we're going to get there so when you finish the vow one of the things you do is you arrive in the temple Toby, if you can just come up you arrive in the temple and um, what happens is the tent in the temple is Okay, if you're in the temple and you see somebody come in with long hair, right? 
you know that they're probably in a position where they've been in this bow uh, for a period of time, whatever that period of time was. Um, so kind of shaggy walks into a temple and uh, comes in for his haircut. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so hair begins to fly. All right. Now, why would you do this? Why would you do this vow? We haven't actually dealt with the why of why we do this vow, right? So we said, okay, this vow happens. It's a, it's a Nazarite vow. Nazarite actually, Nazu, the word Nazu actually means crown of the head. It's actually got to do with the hair in your head. Um, so, so you arrive in the temple, but why have you done this? Okay? You might have been um, struggling might have been struggling with something in your life that you need to actually deal with whatever that thing is that you need to deal with all right you might have been struggling for victory or you might have been struggling for freedom from something whatever that may be so you had this denial of something you had the denial of the wine you had the denial of cutting your hair you had the denial of, of, of a few things in order to Get somewhere better, all right? Something bigger. You did this, you denied something for something bigger. So whatever it is that you are struggling with, it might be unforgiveness as an example, all right? It might be somebody that has wronged you, and for whatever reason you need to let go of that. It might be your parents that have harmed you when you were younger, and you need to get rid of that. All right, desire actually seems to follow from denial. So once you deny, when you deny something, you actually, if you deny something, you actually desire something bigger and something better. Okay, what would you give up to be free? What would you give up to be free? What would you deny to fulfill your desire? See, faith always breaks down if denial is the point. So we say to our children, don't do this because you're a Christian. Don't do that because you're a Christian. That doesn't work, okay? Because it's law-based, okay? My faith is becomes defined by what I don't do and not by what I do, mm. all right? Mm. And our right. faith should be defined by what we do. Mm. All right, guys? That's right. Yeah. Okay? Let's get on the same page and be part of the action and be part of what Jesus wants us to do in fulfilling this changing. And, and I, there was an interesting debate on... Um, Facebook, but posted actually by a friend of ours, Kevin Starsky, who's a lawyer, but he put this picture up of a woman who seemed like maybe from Gaza, running with a child in her arms, and, um, and the quote was, God loves you and God cares for you. And it was obviously a dig at, how can God love or care for somebody like this that's going through all this pain? And he got challenged by a lot of other Christian people saying, oh, you know, how can you be posting something like this? You know, God actually does care for that person. But here's the reality, guys. Does she feel the love of God? Of course no. she doesn't. Of course she doesn't. What does she need? She needs you and I, who have been called by God to change the situation in Gaza or wherever we are, to go up to her with a loaf of bread and a first aid kit in our hands to say God loves you. Right? Because then she's going to believe it. Because this is God in action. This is what God is actually doing. Okay? He can't do it without us, guys. What are you willing to give up to be free? What are you saying, I don't want this because I want this. I want something bigger. Okay? You know, the other thing that happened was the hair was burnt. Oh, gosh. The smell of hair burning is repulsive, right? If you're in the temple and you smelt hair burning, it's a smell of passion. It's a smell of commitment. It's a smell of somebody who's done something, they've given up something to get something bigger. They want something bigger. There's a fullness in the Messiah Jesus that I know is there, but I don't have it. What is that fullness that we should be after? Is there a vow today that you can make? Giving up something for something bigger. 
He said a vow that you can make. I'm just going to encourage you to write it down. Take your phones out and write something down that you want to give up for something better. All right? So let's just pray together. Um, and finish this off. Dear God, thank you for pictures like this. For the scripture that lives and moves and breathes. We thank you for desire. And we thank you that you're a God of desire. Thank you that you call us into our desires, not away from them. Thank you that you call us to pursue them in better ways until our desires reach you. Mm. Only you can meet our deepest, most eternal, soul-satisfying desires. So today we want to understand what denial may mean for us and what it means to say no in order to say yes.